The Attack on the Mill By Emile Zola, 1. It was high holiday at Father Merlier's mill on that pleasant summer afternoon. Three tables had been brought out into the garden and placed end to end in the shade of the great elm, and now they were awaiting the arrival of the guests. It was known throughout the length and breadth of the land that that day was to witness the betrothal of old Merlier's daughter Françoise to Dominique, a young man who was said to be not over-fond of work, but whom never a woman for three leagues of the country around could look at without sparkling eyes. Such a well-favoured young fellow was he. That mill of Father Merlier's was truly a very pleasant spot. It was situated right in the heart of Rocruce, at the place where the main road makes a sharp bend. The village has but a single street, bordered on either side by a row of low, whitened cottages. But just there, where the road curves, there are broad stretches of meadowland and huge trees, which follow the course of the morel, cover the low grounds of the valley with a most delicious shade. All Lorraine has no more charming bit of nature to show. To right and left dense forests, great monarchs of the wood, centuries old, rise from the gentle slopes and fill the horizon with a sea of waving, trembling verdure, while away toward the south extends the plain, of wondrous fertility and checkered almost to infinity with its small enclosures, divided off from one another by their live hedges. But what makes the crowning glory of Rocrus is the coolness of this verdurous nook, even in the hottest days of July and August. The morel comes down from the woods of Gagny, and it would seem as if it gathered to itself on the way all the delicious freshness of the foliage beneath which it glides for many a league. It brings down with it the murmuring sounds, the glacial, solemn shadows of the forest. And that is not the only source of coolness. There are running waters of all sorts singing among the copses. One cannot take a step without coming on a gushing spring and, as he makes his way along the narrow paths, seems to be treading above subterrene lakes that seek the air and sunshine through the moss above and profit by every smallest crevice, at the roots of trees or among the chinks and crannies of the rocks, to burst forth in fountains of crystalline clearness. So numerous and so loud are the whispering voices of these streams that they silence the song of the bullfinches. It is as if one were in an enchanted park, with cascades falling and flashing on every side. The meadows below are never athirst. The shadows beneath the gigantic chestnut trees are of inky blackness, and along the edges of the fields long rows of poplars stand like walls of rustling foliage. There is a double avenue of huge plane trees ascending across the fields toward the ancient castle of Gagny, now gone to rack and ruin. In this region, where drought is never known, vegetation of all kinds is wonderfully rank. It is like a flower garden down there in the low ground between those two wooded hills, a natural garden where the lawns are broad meadows and the giant trees represent colossal beds. When the noonday sun pours down his scorching rays, the shadows lie blue upon the ground. Vegetation slumbers in the genial warmth, while every now and then a breath of almost icy coldness rustles the foliage. Such was the spot where Father Merlier's mill-enlivened nature run riot with its cheerful clack. The building itself, constructed of wood and plaster, looked as if it might be coeval with our planet. Its foundations were in part laved by the morel, which here expands into a clear pool. A dam, a few feet in height, afforded sufficient head of water to drive the old wheel, which creaked and groaned as it revolved, with the asthmatic wheezing of a faithful servant who has grown old in her place. Whenever Father Merlier was advised to change it, he would shake his head and say that like as not a young wheel would be lazier and not so well acquainted with its duties, and then he would set to work and patch up the old one with anything that came to hand. Old hogshead staves, bits of rusty iron, zinc or lead. 
the old wheel only seemed the gayer for it, with its odd round countenance all plumed and feathered with tufts of moss and grass, and when the water poured over it in a silvery tide, its gaunt black skeleton was decked out with a gorgeous display of pearls and diamonds. That portion of the mill which was bathed by the morel had something of the look of a Moorish arch that had been dropped down there by chance. A good half of the structure was built on piles, the water came in under the floor, and there were deep holes, famous throughout the whole country for the eels and the huge crawfish that were to be caught there. Below the fall, the pool was as clear as a looking-glass, and when it was not clouded by foam from the wheel, one could see great fish swimming about in it with the slow, majestic movements of a fleet. There was a broken stairway leading down to the stream, near a stake to which a boat was fastened, and over the wheel was a gallery of wood. Such windows as there were were arranged without any attempt at order. The whole was a quaint conglomeration of nooks and corners, bits of wall, additions made here and there as afterthoughts, beams and roofs that gave the mill the aspect of an old dismantled citadel. But ivy and all sorts of creeping plants had grown luxuriantly and kindly covered up such crevices as were too unsightly, casting a mantle of green over the old dwelling. Young ladies who passed that way used to stop and sketch Father Merlier's mill in their albums. The side of the house that faced the road was less irregular. A gateway in stone afforded access to the principal courtyard, on the right and left hand of which were sheds and stables. Beside a well stood an immense elm that threw its shade over half the court. At the further end, opposite the gate, stood the house, surmounted by a dovecote, the four windows of its first floor symmetrically aligned. The only manifestation of pride that Father Merlier ever allowed himself was to paint this façade every ten years. It had just been freshly whitened at the time of our story, and dazzled the eyes of all the village when the sun lighted it up in the middle of the day. For twenty years had Father Merlier been mayor of Rocruz. He was held in great consideration on account of his fortune. He was supposed to be worth something like eighty thousand francs, the result of patient saving. When he married Madeleine Gilliard, who brought him the mill as her dowry, his entire capital lay in his two strong arms. But Madeleine had never repented of her choice, so manfully had he conducted their joint affairs. Now his wife was dead, and he was left a widower with his daughter Françoise. Doubtless he might have sat himself down to take his rest and suffered the old mill-wheel to sleep among its moss. But he would have found the occupation too irksome, and the house would have seemed dead to him, so he kept on working still for the pleasure of it. In those days, Father Merlier was a tall old man, with a long, unspeaking face, on which a laugh was never seen, but beneath which there lay, nonetheless, a large fund of good humour. He had been elected mayor on account of his money, and also for the impressive air that he knew how to assume when it devolved on him to marry a couple. Françoise Merlier had just completed her eighteenth year. She was small, and for that reason was not accounted one of the beauties of the country. Until she reached the age of fifteen, she was even homely. The good folks of Rocruz could not see how it was that the daughter of father and mother Merlier, such a hale, vigorous couple, had such a hard time of it in getting her growth. When she was fifteen, however, though still remaining delicate, a change came over her, and she took on the prettiest little face imaginable. She had black eyes, black hair, and was red as a rose withal. Her little mouth was always graced with a charming smile. There were delicious dimples in her cheeks, and a crown of sunshine seemed to be ever resting on her fair, candid forehead. Although small as girls went in that region, she was far from being slender. She might not have been able to raise a sack of wheat to her shoulder, but she became quite plump with age, and gave promise of becoming eventually as well-rounded and appetizing as a partridge. 
her father's habits of taciturnity had made her reflective while yet a young girl. If she always had a smile on her lips, it was in order to give pleasure to others. Her natural disposition was serious. As was no more than to be expected, she had every young man in the countryside at her heels as a suitor, more even for her money than for her attractiveness, and she had made a choice at last, a choice that had been the talk and scandal of the entire neighbourhood. On the other side of the morel lived a strapping young fellow who went by the name of Dominique Penquer. He was not to the manner born. Ten years previously, he had come to Rocruse from Belgium to receive the inheritance of an uncle who had owned a small property on the very borders of the forest of Gagny, just facing the mill and distant from it, only a few musket shots. His object in coming was to sell the property, so he said, and return to his own home again. But he must have found the land to his liking, for he made no move to go away. He was seen cultivating his bit of a field and gathering the few vegetables that afforded him an existence. He hunted, he fished. More than once he was near coming in contact with the law through the intervention of the keepers. This independent way of living, of which the peasants could not very clearly see the resources, had in the end given him a bad name. He was vaguely looked on as nothing better than a poacher. At all events he was lazy, for he was frequently found sleeping in the grass at hours when he should have been at work. Then too the hut in which he lived, in the shade of the last trees of the forest, did not seem like the abode of an honest young man. The old women would not have been surprised at any time to hear that he was on friendly terms with the wolves in the ruins of Gagny. Still, the young girls would now and then venture to stand up for him for he was altogether a splendid specimen of manhood, was this individual of doubtful antecedents, tall and straight as a young poplar, with a milk-white skin and ruddy hair and beard that seemed to be of gold when the sun shone on them. Now one fine morning it came to pass that Françoise told Father Merlier that she loved Dominique and that never, never would she consent to marry any other young man. It may be imagined what a knockdown blow it was that Father Merlier received that day. As was his wont, he said never a word. His countenance wore its usual reflective look, only the fun that used to bubble up from within no longer shone in his eyes. Françoise, too, was very serious, and for a week father and daughter scarcely spoke to each other. What troubled Father Merlier was to know how that rascal of a poacher had succeeded in bewitching his daughter. Dominique had never shown himself at the mill. The miller played the spy a little, and was rewarded by catching sight of the gallant on the other side of the morel, lying among the grass and pretending to be asleep. Françoise could see him from her chamber window. The thing was clear enough. They had been making sheep's eyes at each other over the old mill wheel, and so had fallen in love. A week slipped by. Françoise became more and more serious. Father Merlier still continued to say nothing. Then, one evening, of his own accord, he brought Dominique to the house without a word. Françoise was just setting the table. She made no demonstration of surprise. All she did was to add another plate. But her laugh had come back to her, and the little dimples appeared again upon her cheeks. Father Merlier had gone that morning to look for Dominique at his hut on the edge of the forest, and there the two men had had a conference with closed doors and windows that lasted three hours. No one ever knew what they said to each other. The only thing certain is that when Father Merlier left the hut, he already treated Dominique as a son. Doubtless the old man had discovered that he whom he had gone to visit was a worthy young man, even though he did lie in the grass to gain the love of young girls. All Rocruz was up in arms. The women gathered at their doors and could not find words strong enough to characterize Father Merlier's folly in thus receiving a ne'er-do-well into his family. He let them talk. Perhaps he thought of his own marriage. 
neither had he possessed a penny to his name at the time when he married Madeline and her mill, and yet that had not prevented him from being a good husband to her. Moreover, Dominique put an end to their tittle-tattle by setting to work in such strenuous fashion that all the countryside was amazed. It so happened just then that the boy of the mill drew an unlucky number and had to go for a soldier, and Dominique would not hear to their engaging another. He lifted sacks, drove the cart, wrestled with the old wheel when it took an obstinate fit and refused to turn, and all so pluckily and cheerfully that people came from far and near merely for the pleasure of seeing him. Father Merlier laughed his silent laugh. He was highly elated that he had read the youngster aright. There is nothing like love to hearten up young men. In the midst of all that laborious toil, Françoise and Dominique fairly worshipped each other. They had not much to say, but their tender smiles conveyed a world of meaning. Father Merlier had not said a word thus far on the subject of their marriage, and they had both respected his silence, waiting until the old man should see fit to give expression to his will. At last, one day along, toward the middle of July, he had had three tables laid in the courtyard, in the shade of the big elm, and had invited his friends of Rocruz to come that afternoon and drink a glass of wine with him. When the courtyard was filled with people, and everyone there had a full glass in his hand, Father Merlier raised his own high above his head, and said, I have the pleasure of announcing to you that Françoise and this stripling will be married in a month from now, on St. Louis' fête day. Then there was a universal touching of glasses, attended by a tremendous uproar. Everyone was laughing. But Father Merlier, raising his voice above the din, again spoke, Dominique, kiss your wife that is to be. It is no more than customary. And they kissed, very red in the face, both of them, while the company laughed louder still. It was a regular fate. They emptied a small cask. Then, when only the intimate friends of the house remained, conversation went on in a calmer strain. Night had fallen a starlit night, and very clear. Dominique and Françoise sat on a bench, side by side, and said nothing. An old peasant spoke of the war that the emperor had declared against Prussia. All the lads of the village were already gone off to the army. Troops had passed through the place only the night before. There were going to be hard knocks. Bah, said Father Merlier, with the selfishness of a man who is quite happy. Dominique is a foreigner, he won't have to go, and if the Prussians come this way, he will be here to defend his wife. The idea of the Prussians coming there seemed to the company an exceedingly good joke. The army would give them one good, conscientious thrashing, and the affair would be quickly ended. I have seen them, I have seen them, the old peasant repeated in a low voice. There was silence for a little, then they all touched glasses once again. Françoise and Dominique had heard nothing. They had managed to clasp hands behind the bench in such a way as not to be seen by the others, and this condition of affairs seemed so beatific to them that they sat there, mute, their gaze lost in the darkness of the night. What a magnificent, balmy night! The village lay slumbering on either side of the white road as peacefully as a little child. The deep silence was undisturbed, save by the occasional crow of a cock in some distant barnyard, acting on a mistaken impression that dawn was at hand. Perfumed breaths of air, like long-drawn sighs almost, came down from the great woods that lay around and above, sweeping softly over the roofs as if caressing them. The meadows, with their black intensity of shadow, took on a dim, mysterious majesty of their own, while all the springs, all the brooks and watercourses that gargled and trickled in the darkness might have been taken for the cool and rhythmical breathing of the sleeping country. Every now and then the old dozing mill-wheel, like a watchdog that barks uneasily in his slumber, seemed to be dreaming 
as if it were endowed with some strange form of life. It creaked, it groaned, it talked to itself, rocked by the fall of the morel, whose current gave forth the deep, sustained music of an organ pipe. Never was there a more charming or happier nook, never did more entire or deeper peace come down to cover it. 2. One month later to a day, on the eve of the fate of St. Louis, Rocrus was in a state of alarm and dismay. The Prussians had beaten the emperor and were advancing on the village by forced marches. For a week past, people passing along the road had brought tidings of the enemy. They are at Lormiere, they are at Novelle, and by dint of hearing so many stories of the rapidity of their advance, Rocruz woke up every morning in the full expectation of seeing them swarming down out of Gagny Wood. They did not come, however, and that only served to make the affright the greater. They would certainly fall upon the village in the night time and put every soul to the sword. There had been an alarm the night before, a little before daybreak. The inhabitants had been aroused by a great noise of men tramping upon the road. The women were already throwing themselves upon their knees and making the sign of the cross when someone, to whom it happily occurred to peep through a half-opened window, caught sight of red trousers. It was a French detachment. The captain had forthwith asked for the mayor and, after a long conversation with Father Merlier, had remained at the mill. The sun rose bright and clear that morning, giving promise of a warm day. There was a golden light floating over the woodland, while in the low grounds white mists were rising from the meadows. The pretty village, so neat and trim, awoke in the cool dawning, and the country, with its stream and its fountains, was as gracious as a freshly plucked bouquet. But the beauty of the day brought gladness to the face of no one. The villagers had watched the captain and seen him circle round and round the old mill, examine the adjacent houses, then pass to the other bank of the morel, and from thence scan the country with a field glass. Father Merlier, who accompanied him, appeared to be giving explanations. After that, the captain had posted some of his men behind walls, behind trees, or in hollows. The main body of the detachment had encamped in the courtyard of the mill. So there was going to be a fight then. And when Father Merlier returned, they questioned him. He spoke no word, but slowly and sorrowfully nodded his head. Yes, there was going to be a fight. Francoise and Dominique were there in the courtyard, watching him. He finally took his pipe from his lips and gave utterance to these few words. Ah, my poor children, I shall not be able to marry you today. Dominique, with lips tight set and an angry frown upon his forehead, raised himself on tiptoe from time to time and stood with eyes bent on Gagny Wood, as if he would have been glad to see the Prussians appear and end the suspense they were in. Françoise, whose face was grave and very pale, was constantly passing back and forth, supplying the needs of the soldiers. They were preparing their soup in a corner of the courtyard, joking and chaffing one another while awaiting their meal. The captain appeared to be highly pleased. He had visited the chambers and the great hall of the mill that looked out on the stream. Now, seated beside the well, he was conversing with Father Merlier. You have a regular fortress here, he was saying. We shall have no trouble in holding it until evening. The bandits are late. They ought to be here by this time. The miller looked very grave. He saw his beloved mill going up in flame and smoke, but uttered no word of remonstrance or complaint, considering that it would be useless. He only opened his mouth to say, You ought to take steps to hide the boat. There is a hole behind the wheel fitted to hold it. Perhaps you may find it of use to you. The captain gave an order to one of his men. This captain was a tall, fine-looking man of about forty, with an agreeable expression of countenance. The sight of Dominique and Françoise seemed to afford him much pleasure. He watched them as if he had forgotten all about the approaching conflict. 
he followed Françoise with his eyes as she moved about the courtyard, and his manner showed clearly enough that he thought her charming. Then, turning to Dominique, "'You are not with the army, I see, my boy?' he abruptly asked. "'I'm a foreigner,' the young man replied. The captain did not seem particularly pleased with the answer. He winked his eyes and smiled. Françoise was doubtless a more agreeable companion than a musket would have been. Dominique, noticing his smile, made haste to add, "'I am a foreigner, but I can lodge a rifle bullet in an apple at five hundred yards. See, there's my rifle behind you.' "'You may find use for it,' the captain dryly answered. Françoise had drawn near. She was trembling a little, and Dominique, regardless of the bystanders, took and held firmly clasped in his own the two hands that she held forth to him, as if committing herself to his protection. The captain smiled again, but said nothing more. He remained seated, his sword between his legs, his eyes fixed on space, apparently lost in dreamy reverie. It was ten o'clock. The heat was already oppressive. A deep silence prevailed. The soldiers had sat down in the shade of the sheds in the courtyard and begun to eat their soup. Not a sound came from the village where the inhabitants had all barricaded their houses, doors and windows. A dog, abandoned by his master, howled mournfully upon the road. From the woods and the nearby meadows that lay fainting in the heat came a long-drawn whispering, soughing sound produced by the union of what wandering breaths of air there were. A cuckoo sang, then the silence became deeper still, and all at once upon that lazy, sleepy air a shot rang out. The captain rose quickly to his feet, the soldiers left their half-emptied plates. In a few seconds all were at their posts. The mill was occupied from top to bottom, and yet the captain, who had gone out through the gate, saw nothing. To right and left the road stretched away, desolate and blindingly white in the fierce sunshine. A second report was heard, and still nothing to be seen, not even so much as a shadow. But just as he was turning to re-enter, he chanced to look over toward Gagny, and there beheld a little puff of smoke floating away on the tranquil air like thistledown. The deep peace of the forest was apparently unbroken. The rascals have occupied the wood, the officer murmured. They know we are here. Then the firing went on and became more and more continuous between the French soldiers posted about the mill and the Prussians concealed among the trees. The bullets whistled over the morel without doing any mischief on either side. The firing was irregular. Every bush seemed to have its marksman, and nothing was to be seen save those bluish smoke wreaths that hung for a moment on the wind before they vanished. It lasted thus for nearly two hours. The officer hummed a tune with a careless air. Françoise and Dominique, who had remained in the courtyard, raised themselves to look out over a low wall. They were more particularly interested in a little soldier who had his post on the bank of the morel behind the hull of an old boat. He would lie face downward on the ground, watch his chance, deliver his fire, then slip back into a ditch a few steps in his rear to reload, and his movements were so comical he displayed such cunning and activity that it was difficult for anyone watching him to refrain from smiling. He must have caught sight of a Prussian, for he rose quickly and brought his piece to the shoulder, but before he could discharge it, he uttered a loud cry, whirled completely around in his tracks and fell backward into the ditch, where for an instant his legs moved convulsively just as the claws of a fowl do when it is beheaded. The little soldier had received a bullet directly through his heart. It was the first casualty of the day. Françoise instinctively seized Dominique's hand and held it tight in a convulsive grasp. "'Come away from there,' said the captain. "'The bullets reach us here.' As if to confirm his words, a slight, sharp sound was heard up in the old elm, and the end of a branch 
came to the ground, turning over and over as it fell. But the two young people never stirred, riveted to the spot as they were by the interest of the spectacle. On the edge of the wood, a Prussian had suddenly emerged from behind a tree as an actor comes upon the stage from the wings, beating the air with his arms and falling over upon his back. And beyond that, there was no movement. The two dead men appeared to be sleeping in the bright sunshine. There was not a soul to be seen in the fields on which the heat lay heavy. Even the sharp rattle of the musketry had ceased. Only the morel kept on whispering to itself with its low, musical murmur. Father Merlier looked at the captain with an astonished air, as if to inquire whether that were the end of it. Here comes their attack, the officer murmured. Look out for yourself. Don't stand there. The words were scarcely out of his mouth when a terrible discharge of musketry ensued. The great elm was riddled, its leaves came eddying down as thick as snowflakes. Fortunately, the Prussians had aimed too high. Dominique dragged, almost carried Françoise from the spot, while Father Merlier followed them, shouting, Get into the small cellar, the walls are thicker there. But they paid no attention to him. They made their way to the main hall, where ten or a dozen soldiers were silently waiting, watching events outside through the chinks of the closed shutters. The captain was left alone in the courtyard, where he sheltered himself behind the low wall, while the furious fire was maintained uninterruptedly. The soldiers whom he had posted outside only yielded their ground inch by inch. They came crawling in, however, one after another, as the enemy dislodged them from their positions. Their instructions were to gain all the time they could, taking care not to show themselves in order that the Prussians might remain in ignorance of the force they had opposed to them. Another hour passed, and at a sergeant came in, reporting that there were now only two or three men left outside, the officer took his watch from his pocket, murmuring, Half past two. Come, we must hold out for four hours yet. He caused the great gate of the courtyard to be tightly secured and everything was made ready for an energetic defence. The Prussians were on the other side of the morel, consequently there was no reason to fear an assault at the moment. There was a bridge indeed, a mile and a quarter away, but they were probably unaware of its existence, and it was hardly to be supposed that they would attempt to cross the stream by fording. The officer therefore simply caused the road to be watched. The attack, when it came, was to be looked for from the direction of the fields. The firing had ceased again. The mill appeared to lie there in the sunlight, void of all life. Not a shutter was open, not a sound came from within. Gradually, however, the Prussians began to show themselves at the edge of Gagny Wood. Heads were protruded here and there, they seemed to be mustering up their courage. Several of the soldiers within the mill brought up their pieces to an aim, but the captain shouted, No, no, not yet, wait, let them come nearer. They displayed a great deal of prudence in their advance, looking at the mill with a distrustful air. They seemed hardly to know what to make of the old structure, so lifeless and gloomy with its curtains of ivy. Still, they kept on advancing. When there were fifty of them or so in the open, directly opposite, the officer uttered one word. Now! A crashing, tearing discharge burst from the position, succeeded by an irregular dropping fire. François, trembling violently, involuntarily raised her hands to her ears. Dominique, from his position behind the soldiers, pressed out upon the field, and when the smoke drifted away a little, counted three Prussians extended on their backs in the middle of the meadow. The others had sought shelter among the willows and the poplars. And then commenced the siege. For more than an hour the mill was riddled with bullets. They beat and rattled on its old walls like hail. The noise they made was plainly audible as they struck the stonework, were flattened, and fell back into the water. They buried themselves in the woodwork with a dull thud. Occasionally, a creaking sound would announce that the wheel had been hit. 
Within the building, the soldiers husbanded their ammunition, firing only when they could see something to aim at. The captain kept consulting his watch every few minutes, and as a ball split one of the shutters in halves and then lodged in the ceiling. Four o'clock, he murmured. We shall never be able to hold the position. The old mill, in truth, was gradually going to pieces beneath that terrific fire. A shutter that had been perforated again and again until it looked like a piece of lace fell off its hinges into the water and had to be replaced by a mattress. Every moment almost, Father Merlier exposed himself to the fire in order to take account of the damage sustained by his poor wheel, every wound of which was like a bullet in his own heart. Its period of usefulness was ended this time for certain. He would never be able to patch it up again. Dominique had besought Françoise to retire to a place of safety, but she was determined to remain with him. She had taken a seat behind a great oaken clothes press which afforded her protection. A ball struck the press, however, the sides of which gave out a dull, hollow sound, whereupon Dominique stationed himself in front of Françoise. He had as yet taken no part in the firing, although he had his rifle in his hand. The soldiers occupied the whole breadth of the windows, so that he could not get near them. At every discharge, the floor trembled. Look out! Look out! the captain suddenly shouted. He had just descried a dark mass emerging from the wood. As soon as they gained the open, they set up a telling platoon fire. It struck the mill like a tornado. Another shutter parted company, and the bullets came whistling in through the yawning aperture. Two soldiers rolled upon the floor. One lay where he fell and never moved a limb. His comrades pushed him up against the wall because he was in their way. The other writhed and twisted, beseeching someone to end his agony, but no one had ears for the poor wretch. The bullets were still pouring in, and everyone was looking out for himself and searching for a loophole whence he might answer the enemy's fire. A third soldier was wounded, that one said not a word, but with staring, haggard eyes sank down beneath a table. François, horror-stricken by the dreadful spectacle of the dead and dying men, mechanically pushed away her chair and seated herself on the floor against the wall. It seemed to her that she would be smaller there and less exposed. In the meantime, men had gone and secured all the mattresses in the house. The opening of the window was partially closed again. The hall was filled with debris of every description, broken weapons, dislocated furniture. Five o'clock, said the captain. Stand fast, boys. They are going to make an attempt to pass the stream. Just then, Françoise gave a shriek. A bullet had struck the floor, and rebounding, grazed her forehead on the ricochet. A few drops of blood appeared. Dominique looked at her, then went to the window and fired his first shot, and from that time kept on firing uninterruptedly. He kept on loading and discharging his piece mechanically, paying no attention to what was passing at his side, only pausing from time to time to cast a look at Françoise. He did not fire hurriedly or at random, moreover, but took deliberate aim. As the captain had predicted, the Prussians were skirting the belt of poplars and attempting the passage of the Morel, but each time that one of them showed himself, he fell with one of Dominique's bullets in his brain. The captain, who was watching the performance, was amazed. He complimented the young man, telling him that he would like to have many more marksmen of his skill. Dominique did not hear a word he said. A ball struck him in the shoulder, another raised a contusion on his arm, and still he kept on firing. There were two more deaths. The mattresses were torn to shreds and no longer availed to stop the windows. The last volley that was poured in seemed as if it would carry away the mill bodily, so fierce it was. The position was no longer tenable. Still the officer kept repeating, Stand fast. Another half hour yet. He was counting the minutes, one by one now. He had promised his commanders that he would hold the enemy there until nightfall, and he would not budge a hair's breadth before the moment 
that he had fixed on for his withdrawal. He maintained his pleasant air of good humour, smiling at Françoise by way of reassuring her. He had picked up the musket of one of the dead soldiers and was firing away with the rest. There were but four soldiers left in the room. The Prussians were showing themselves en masse on the other bank of the Morel, and it was evident that they might now pass the stream at any moment. A few moments more elapsed, the captain was as determined as ever and would not give the order to retreat when a sergeant came running into the room saying, They are on the road. They are going to take us in rear. The Prussians must have discovered the bridge. The captain drew out his watch again. Five minutes more, he said. They won't be here within five minutes. Then exactly at six o'clock, he at last withdrew his men through a little postern that opened on a narrow lane, whence they threw themselves into the ditch and in that way reached the forest of Sauval. The captain took leave of Father Merlier with much politeness, apologizing profusely for the trouble he had caused. He even added, Try to keep them occupied for a while. We shall return. While this was occurring, Dominique had remained alone in the hall. He was still firing away, hearing nothing conscious of nothing. His sole thought was to defend Françoise. The soldiers were all gone, and he had not the remotest idea of the fact. He aimed and brought down his man at every shot. All at once there was a great tumult. The Prussians had entered the courtyard from the rear. He fired his last shot, and they fell upon him with his weapon still smoking in his hand. It required four men to hold him. The rest of them swarmed about him, vociferating like madmen in their horrible dialect. Françoise rushed forward to intercede with her prayers. They were on the point of killing him on the spot, but an officer came in and made them turn the prisoner over to him. After exchanging a few words in German with his men, he turned to Dominique and said to him roughly, in very good French, You will be shot in two hours from now. <laughs>